In this film, we'll be discussing what regenerative cities are and why we need them. For the last 10,000 years, we have been enjoying a period of favourable climate known as the Holocene. However, some researchers suggest that we have left the Holocene period and entered a new geologic age created by human activity that is currently defined by the highest temperatures for 4,000 years. This period has been called the Anthropocene. We have apparently become a fundamental force shaping natural life and the future of our planet. This raises profound questions of how we should live with one another and with the natural world in order to reduce our negative impacts and increase our positive impacts. As the focus of human life, cities are central to these questions. The needs of cities are significant. Despite urbanised areas only covering between 1 and 6% of the Earth's surface, they have huge ecological footprints that can extend to 300 times the area of the city itself, and they are responsible for 80% of carbon emissions. As a result, there is now growing interest in cities that are regenerative. That is, cities that develop an environmentally enhancing, restorative relationship with the natural systems whose resources they depend on. So how do we go about achieving the regenerative city? Cities support urban life by providing certain services, for example, energy, water, air quality, food, waste processing, mobility and logistics, information and communication technology, or ICT, and physical and mental well-being. Designing and delivering these services requires many different professions, organisations and people who all need to work together so that we can tackle the problem of reducing our impact on the planet. However, there are significant challenges in finding ways to describe and think about our cities that we all agree on. The geographical borders can be difficult to define and each city has grown in complex and dynamic ways to be unique. This complexity means that cities can be conceptualised in any number of ways. For example, using systems thinking, cities can be seen as a collection of hard infrastructural systems, a system of systems, consisting of various technical pipes, wires, wireless technologies, green infrastructures such as vegetation and blue infrastructures such as watercourses. But many would argue that it is no longer acceptable to exclude soft but no less essential infrastructure systems such as the social infrastructures of governance, behaviour, design and healthcare from systems of systems. An alternative view of the city is as an entity that consists of a series of energy and material flows, the urban metabolism. The urban metabolism approach often considers the quantification of inputs, outputs and storage, or stocks and flows, of energy, water, nutrients, materials and wastes of urban areas. As such, it is often used to highlight the unsustainable rates of material consumption, both during a city's construction and operation, and the mismatch between requirement and production. The approach has primarily been used as a static accounting framework for specific substances, and it could be argued that this approach does not sufficiently describe the complex and dynamic systems underlying these processes, such as infrastructure, sensing, information processing and decision making. In the context of an organism, this would be an oversimplification, because although metabolism is a critical function, it is not sufficient to characterise the entire system. For example, human metabolism does not describe a human. A more nuanced understanding of the effect of complex and dynamic underlying systems and processes on urban metabolic flows is therefore essential for more informed decision making about the design of future cities. Closely related to urban metabolism is the concept of urban ecosystems. Rather than consider urban areas as a closed system or network, it sees cities as interacting with and responding to other surrounding environments. However, the concept often makes a clear distinction between natural and man-made systems, and it is not clear how designed and engineered systems sit within it. For example, how do we think about the management of an urban ecosystem? Who manages it? What are the feedback loops? And how are decisions made? It seems then that the concept of the regenerative city should combine the most useful aspect of the systems of systems, urban metabolism and urban ecosystem thinking 
namely an appreciation of dynamic coupling effects, cascading failures, quantification of material and resource inputs and outputs, geographical and ecological interdependencies, and service delivery. Clearly, most of the existing and next generation city infrastructure systems will require novel design, engineering, management and learning paradigms, and it is essential that these paradigms take account of the messy reality of complex cities, as idealised plans, models and tools are only as strong as the assumptions they are based on. The result could be feedback-rich cities that mimic the functioning of biological systems and recycle resources in a circular economy approach, eroding the delineations between the natural and built environments. Such cities might be more adaptable, more resilient and more regenerative, enabling processes of human interaction and connection that lead to prosperity, diversity, innovation and welfare. <laughs>